Hey guys, today's video on uh, this YouTube channel, birdsupplies.com, is going to be about separation and grief in our pet birds. So, I get questions all the time as a bird behaviorist about, you know, things that have to do with feather plucking and contributing factors for that. And so, like, here's one that I got just this morning. This is a question from Lily, and she says that she's got a yellow bed Lori who's exhibiting feather uh, destructive behavior after her two other birds passed away. I'm really sorry to hear about that, Lily. Um, it's something I hear quite a bit, bit, and I'd be happy to help you if I can. Um, you're saying that it's clear that your bird gets lonely while you're away at work and that you guys have taken measures the best you can of course to see uh, how you can you know address her loneliness and her sadness while you're away but that you uh, as a parent par parent you're worrying about whether your birds destroying its feathers while you're at work and you asked uh, I want to get a collar but I'm wary of her eating the fluff and getting crop impaction if she preens the collar any thoughts so I've got a couple thoughts. First, let's talk about the collar thoughts. Yeah, collars interrupt the plucking cycle and um, they don't really change long-term behavior. But in terms of my bird collars, and I can only speak to my brand, Unruffled RX Bird Collars, uh, we make our bird collars out of uh, thick Polar Tech style fleece and that's a knit fabric. So if your bird chews into it, it's not going to be stringy or anything. It'll simply puncture a hole in the fabric. And so when we've seen a tattered or used collar you know come back in or people send pictures the collars just kind of bunched up with a bunch of holes it's not like there's any strings that a bird can swallow or chew up um, uh, it doesn't even come off in pieces per se it uh, just you know looks pretty uh, I guess like a bunch of holes in it so that's my thoughts about the collars. It's unlikely that you're going to experience crop expansion. In fact, I've never had anybody um, approach me about that at all. So uh, my other thoughts, though, are, yeah, you can help your bird uh, reduce the separation anxiety and uh, enjoy life again even though you have to go back to work and uh, I'll, that's what this video is about that's what I'm going to talk about so you know that's happening separation anxiety is going to be something that's happening for a lot of us as things are opening up we're going back to work full-time our kids are going back to school our other kids are our older kids are going off to college so we're going to talk about that and figure out some ways to support you and your bird into making this transition uh, as smooth as possible. So stick around and you're going to get some valuable insights into what your bird needs, um, why it needs what it needs, and what you can do about it. So first let me introduce myself. Um, if you're new to my YouTube channel, a little bit about me. I'm Diane Burrows. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I'm a psychotherapist with uh, 30 years of experience in hospitals and, and uh, in private practice and whatnot. I am also a bird lover, and so I'm the founder and CEO of birdsupplies.com, which is like a 22-year-old company that is dedicated to helping people learn and uh, utilize science-backed parrot wellness strategies. So my products have been featured in the Journal of Avian Medicine and Surgery. They've been shown at Exotics Con, which is a conference that's for exotic pet vets um, or exotic vets that work with you know exotic pets like parrots reptiles and the like so they were featured in the 2019 exotics con i've also been featured on side hustle pod the podcast i've been asked to come back on that and i've authored a number of books like the feather plucking workbook behind me these are some of my uh products that i manufacture as well as some other people's i don't manufacture a couple of these uh, so let's get with the separation anxiety talk so what is separation anxiety exactly. As a therapist I can tell you that separation anxiety is one of a number of anxiety disorders but all, dis uh, all anxiety disorders are like a physiological reaction that are over and above the situation that warrants it or then induces it. So in birds when we're seeing our birds experience um, anxiety it comes out in ways that are uh, as a behaviorist we know are rather predictable but there you have to kind of put the pieces together to really understand it so you might be seeing behaviors like increased 
aggression, um, increase in plucking behavior, feather plucking behavior, or your bird may turn its anxieties inward and become more quiet and lethargic and not enjoy normal parrot activities anymore. It might engage in stereotypical behaviors like, you know, toe tapping or pacing back and forth, or you might hear more screaming as a way to let that anxiety out. So I liken it to panic attacks. If you've ever watched that movie, Something's Gotta Give with Diane Keaton and Jack Nicholson, you've seen a panic attack in acting, if you will, um, where you know Jack Nicholson's this lifelong bachelor and falls in love. Uh, in uh, unlikely circumstances where he has a heart attack at Diane Keaton's house and he has to stay there for uh, a very long weekend I think while he's recuperating and they the couple falls in love and uh, but Jack's not ready to give up his bachelor ways and so he starts having panic attacks over it and and finally realizes hey I need to make some life-changing events but when he's having these panic attacks it's hilarious in the movie but it's definitely not hilarious for someone that's having a panic attack panic attack. I mean, he thinks he's going to die. And uh, yeah, he winds up in the hospital a couple of times over it and stuff. And so, you know, that's how our birds kind of feel. They think they're going to die with uh, this level of anxiety, this separation anxiety that um, they experience on things like, you know, um, a flock mate dying and whatnot. So, um, with that said, uh, let's dive a little deeper into what causes separation anxiety or anxiety of any sort because they're all related. They're all related to brain chemistry, genetics, early uh, life impacts, as well as wellness um, uh, things. So, genetically, a bird could, uh, you know, be uh, spawn, if you will, I guess that's not the right word, but uh, their parents could be anxious in nature in that, you know, we know that there's a genetic predisposition for anxiety disorders, um, but we also know that there's a family predisposition. So, for instance, I have um, an acquaintance who has anxiety and everybody in her family has anxiety and it's hard to know whether it's the anxiety is sit is genetic or if it's um, you know when you're raised by someone with anxiety you learn to be scared of everything and or or overreactive to everything and so you know uh, those are both components situational that would be you know separating situational versus genetics. But we also know that early life impacts are huge in uh, terms of anxiety. So for instance, think of a pet bird who um, uh, is reared you know, by a breeder, uh, bred by a breeder, pulled from mom and dad's nest before it even gets its feathers to be um, hand fed for the pet trade. Um, so in the wild, birds stay with their parents for actually a pretty lengthy period of time um, relative to their life span in particular. So like smaller birds who have a shorter lifespan don't spend as much time with mom and dad, but they do spend time in the flock where the flock really um, gives them a lot of, you know, uh, um, relationships to interact with. However, um, getting back to the early impacts of being pulled from mom and dad you know our uh, pet bird wild pet birds especially the medium to larger pet birds might spend one to three years learning all the ins and outs of how to survive in a parrot flock in the wild from their parents so mom and dad are teaching them everything from what foods to eat to what predators look like to where to get the best food and know that it's ripe and and good for you and healthy staying away from poisonous foods all of that our pet birds never learn any of that and they need us as the pet parents to teach them that but over and above the that early impact of being removed from mom and dad then they're traumatized with this gavage feeding or shrinch feeding where you know we shove a bunch of food down their mouth and hope they don't choke or a long tube down their crop um, I mean, that's got to be pretty darn traumatic for our pet birds. And in fact, there's a lot of research about it. There's research that says that birds have been pulled from their parents and um, they tend to be more anxious and aggressive. The males tend to be much more aggressive than the females, of course. But that uh, even the style of hand feeding, gavage, which is where that uh, rod is put down the throat and into the crop, 
is uh, probably the most damaging and those birds tend to be extremely anxious and extremely aggressive as they get older. Much more aggressive than birds that have been fed from a spoon where they can you know, swallow at their own pace um, and uh, even more aggressive than those birds that have been fed with um, shringes. So those early life impacts are huge in terms of anxiety, but so is parrot husbandry. And parrot husbandry, again, is everything that needs to happen in order for a bird to be physically and emotionally safe. So one of the things that we know as uh, behaviorists, as psychotherapists, when I get someone that comes into my office uh, with anxiety, you know, the first rule of thumb is to educate them about three important wellness issues, diet, sleep and exercise. We know that diet impacts brain chemistry. In other words, you know, if a person is malnourished and not getting enough of the nutrients that they need to satisfy their brain, um, then they develop um, psychiatric disorders. Uh, there's a whole science on that. In fact, I'm uh, actually certified as a nutritional, uh, nutrition and mental health uh, therapist for that. So uh, we know that diet's huge. We know that sleep's huge. I mean, just think about it for yourself. If you don't get adequate sleep, you're grumpy the next day and you're sure as heck not doing your best job at work. Um, if you have a sleep disorder or sleep apnea, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But if you ever missed out or you know had jet lag or anything like that, you know how important sleep is. Well, our parrots need 10 to 12 hours of sleep a night and most of us don't realize that. So we get home from work and we want our parrots to hang out with us, you know, till 10 o'clock at night and uh, then get up, turn around and get up and and uh, you know, be ready and eating breakfast with us before we go off to work in the morning. So these birds are sleep deprived and that affects brain chemistry as well and it affects your parrot's mood and its behavior. Another thing that affects mood and behavior is the amount of exercise that you get. We all know uh, if you go to your doctor, you know, they'll tell you that one of their first questions I mean is, is they'll say, uh, you know, do you exercise? My doctor always asks me that. And of course I do exercise, so I'm okay with that. But you know, if you're not exercising, your brain chemistry, it affects your brain chemistry and it affects your overall well-being. And our parrots are no different. In the wild, our parrots fly miles and miles a day looking for different foraging sites and water sites and stuff. And um, you know, a caged bird just doesn't get the diet, the sleep, and the exercise that a wild bird does. But we can modify that to improve parrot wellness. And I'll talk a little bit about that. In fact, I've got other videos on that uh, that I'll put down in the show notes for you. Now, grief's a little different. Grief is when your bird loses uh, a perceived flock mate. Um, and it hits birds just as hard or maybe even harder as it hits us. So for instance, in the wild, birds have flocks that are maybe, you know, a thousand to 10,000 strong. Um, some of the larger flocks like African greys and cockatoos, those birds live in flocks of 10,000. Now things are way different for our pet birds whose flock includes our individual family unit. So say you have a, a partner uh, in life, you know, maybe a couple of kids and a dog and a cat. So you got, what, six people in your flock are six individuals in your flock. Your bird doesn't care if they're people or birds or whatnot. That's their flock. And one of them uh, leaves. Well, that's approximately 20% of their flock just boom, out the door, disappeared. So when a person goes back to work, a kid goes back to school, that sort of thing, that's what your bird's experiencing is an intense level of grief. Um, and uh, that really will shake its world. And so we need to develop some solutions that will help our birds survive both the separation anxiety and potential grief that it's going to experience as we're going back to work post COVID August, 2021. So let's talk about solutions. So if you're familiar with my blogs, my social media, other videos, you know, that I've done on this channel, you've heard me talk about how important it is to support our birds' challenging behaviors with three important strategies. And this is science-backed. It's not something I've pulled out of a hat. We know as a behaviorist that if you want to change behavior, whether it's with a human being, as a psychotherapist, with a child, you know, 
or with a pet that's having challenging bird behaviors, uh, and I'll talk specifically about birds now, we need to do three things. We need to in, um, improve wellness, we need to reduce the triggers, and we need to provide more intensive behavioral supports. So, in terms of wellness, and I won't reiterate this because I've got videos about it, but wellness involves everything physical and emotional that needs to happen. That's, you know, diet, sleep, exercise, um, and then the emotional things that need to happen, uh, which is, you know, socialization and enrichment, and then, you know, kind of lifelong things like geriatric and pediatric care, as well as preventative care and pain management. So that's what wellness is in a nutshell. Sounds like a lot, um, but what, per, what we're gonna talk about today is the diet, the exercise, and um, the sleep. Now, antecedent rearrangement, in a nutshell, is figuring out what triggers an anxious episode and then rearranging the environment so that the bird doesn't have to experience that as intensely anymore. And then other behavioral supports are the ABA therapy techniques that I'm trained in, as are many other uh, animal behaviorists um, and, and human uh, behaviorists. Um, but I'll explain them a little bit, but it does get pretty murky because there's so much terminology and um, interactive things, so it's kind of like, uh, it might be information overload, so I don't want to put you there, that's for sure. Uh, I, we do know that, you know, the things that I mentioned, wellness and antecedent rearrangement, you know, we know as therapists that wellness works the best with the most cases. Uh, next, we need to look at antecedent arrangement. And then, you know, if neither one of those work out, then we, it's time to move on to uh, these ABA practices. And that's when you would book a behavior consultation with someone like myself. So, as I had mentioned, I'm uh, a nutrition for mental health specialist, I've been certified in that, and uh, we know that nutrition plays a huge role in mental health. In fact, certain nutrients are required by the brain and the nervous system in order to function properly. Um, you know, different uh, nutrients uh, help the nervous system function well, it, they enforce uh, how the synapses, those neurons in your brain, are firing and communicating with the each other and they also enforce how neurotransmitters which you've probably heard of things like serotonin norepinephrine and that kind of stuff that are in the brain how they communicate with the brain chemistry it gets pretty intense and it might get too intense for this uh, video but what we know is that in order to operate in full throttle if you will the brain needs certain nutrients like zinc magnesium calcium, omega fatty acids, vitamin uh, B complex, um, iodine, and such. So, like we know that calcium and magnesium are some of the most abundant minerals in the body. And without calcium and magnesium, the brain's not gonna function properly. Uh, without zinc, the brain's not gonna be functioning properly. And all of these nutrients actually kind of work in cohort, with, if you will, with all of the other nutrients. So for instance, I manufacture a product called Bird Calcium Magnesium Plus Vitamin D3. The reason I uh, have all three of those in one supplement is because I want a complete supplement, something that's gonna actually work right out of the bottle for my customers. And so calcium requires magnesium in order to work properly, and it requires vitamin D3 to actually synthesize uh, in the body. And so without the three components in the proper proportions, um, Calcium's not gonna work without those other two. So, uh, you know, you need to kind of be thinking about the full range of nutrients that your bird needs in order to have its brain function properly. Now, I tell you this because a lot of the bird foods that we buy off the shelf, say PetSmart, you know, Petco, or even a dedicated bird store, just aren't sufficient uh, for a bird. We're finding out that, well, we've known for years that seed is, uh, feeding your bird bird seed is kind of like giving your kid a bag of chips and talkies and expecting that that's going to satisfy all of their nutritional needs. Well, we all know that's not the case. It's, 
I mean, that kid might prefer it, but we need to get our kids to eat their vegetables and a rich range of foods in order to grow properly. Kids that don't uh, eat full nutrients, uh, a full range of nutrients, you know, they end up being smaller and shorter, brains don't work as well, it affects their IQ, it affects their mood, and so uh, your bird's no different. A seed diet is um, like feeding your kid chips and, and uh, cookies all day long. Pellets are good if they're made correctly, but there's only a really a handful of pellets that vets actually endorse. And the ones that we know that are the best bird pellets, they're kind of expensive and they're hard to find. You'd have to go to a bird dedicated store. That some, of, Well, many of them are on Amazon. Actually, there's only three of them, so two of them are on Amazon. Uh, so the pellets that vets talk about the most, if you go to your vet and you say, your avian vet, and ask, okay, what pellet do you recommend? They're either going to recommend Harrison's bird pellets, Rowdy Bush, and some of them will recommend tops. Now here's the difference between pellets. Pellets can either may, be made as uh, what we call extruded pellets where the, the manufacturer takes the grains, the vegetables, all of this, grind it up, make it in a mix like it's cookie dough or something, you know, liken it to that, mix it up, uh, bake it, and then that's the pellet. So baking uh, tends to diminish the nutritional availability of uh, our vitamins that are plant-based vitamins. Whereas uh, a, a product called Tops Pellets, T-O-P-S, uh, which is available only on their website, I believe, um, is cold pressed. In other words, they take these vegetables and you can literally, literally see the greens and stuff in the pellet that they make. And they manufacture it using what's called a cold pressed process. The pressed is, um, you know, how they get it all to stick together in a pellet form. Um, so anyway, uh, what we know is that, you know, um, pellets are a kind of a smaller proportion than we originally thought of what a bird needs in their diet. So in other words, what the latest research is showing us is that it kind of turns the pyramid upside down. We used to think that the foundation of a bird's diet needed to be, you know, 60 to 70 percent pellets and the rest plant-based foods. Now it's to be flipped it. It's more like 60% of the diet, or give or take, depending on the species, needs to be a rich range, a vast range of raw vegetables, fruits, grains, herbs, sprouts, nuts, um, you know, in a, uh, in a chop style mix. And the rest, the 40%, give or take, needs to be one of these three high quality pellets. So uh, nutrients are really super important for your bird. I mean, you can never replicate the kind of nutritional availability that a bird, a wild bird has in the jungles or in the rainforest. You know, just imagine all the fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds and all that, you know, that uh, wild birds have. But providing a very rich range of plant-based, raw, uncooked, products that you've not cooked the vitamins out of is super important for your bird. Now the next thing about wellness is providing your bird enrichment opportunities. So, you know, I talk about that a lot in my book, Teach Your Bird to Forage. We know that if you keep your bird busy, offer enrichment uh, and exercise opportunities, that it's busy, its mind is busy, its body is busy. And that helps ward off serious psychiatric illnesses like separation anxiety. So you're gonna to wanna to teach your bird how to forage. Mom and dad in the wild teach their young how to forage, but if we don't know how to teach our pet bird to forage, we're doing it a disservice. So foraging is where a bird actually has to work for its food. You know, uh, wild birds have to fly all over the place, miles and miles a day, to find the exact food that they need when it's ripe, and they have to put a lot of brain power into it, a lot of exercise into getting their food, and then once they get there, say it's a big nut that they have to crack open, or you know, uh, a seed that they have to open to get to the pulp, or digging in the ground to get to the roots that are going to provide it that nutrient that it's getting that day. That's what we call working for their food. Now our birds 
our pet birds have it really different. You know, they're in a small cage, they don't have to exercise to get to their food in the first place, but over and above that, we got this little nifty bowl there full of everything that we think they need that day. They don't have to work for it at all. So instead of spending hours a day trying to work for its food, our pet birds get their food in five minutes and then they have the rest of the day to be bored as hell and have nothing else to do but get anxious because they're so bored. If you've ever been bored, um, which you probably have in COVID, <laughs> you know, you find yourself pacing and doing things or trying to figure out what can I do with my day? And that's what your bird is doing all day long. So if you want to learn how to forage, get my book, uh, Teaching Your Bird How to Forage, and then also you can get on Pinterest. Pinterest gives you now my book teaches you how to teach your bird how to forage. Pinterest teaches you how to make fun foraging toys really affordably. And so you just have to kind of put that in the search, you know, how to how to make bird foraging toys and it'll show you, you know, different categories. I mean foraging toys for small birds are going to be very different than foraging toys for a large macaw. So, you know, figure that out. Um, on, on your own, but you can get my book to learn how to teach your bird how to forage so that it's not scared. Otherwise, if you just, you know, leave for work and throw a box in there and you expect your bird to dig it, chew it open and find the, you know, nourishment foods that you've put in there, um, your bird's going to leave it alone. It's not going to have any interest in it. So teach your bird to forage first. Other ways to keep your bird busy are to offer it exercise and enrichment before you go to work and after you get home from work. So develop some routines. Um, for instance, you know, one of my routines when I'm working outside of the home is to, uh, you know, get up, um, create a nutritious vegetable-based breakfast for my birds, is to get up, create a uh, nutritional vegetable-based breakfast for my birds. And then uh, I want that to be their most nutritious meal of the day because they've been hungry, you know, and uh, food deprived, if you will, all night long. So they're more likely to eat that rich range of vegetables that um, I want them to eat. And uh, so that's why I feed uh, the vegetables first thing in the morning before I go to work. But I also throw in some foraging toys in their cage. Another thing that I do with my birds when I have time is to exercise them and enrich them before I go to work. So I'm getting them out on their cage. I might uh, give them a shower or bath. I usually have a shower perch in my bath that I uh, use for my birds and we bathe and so I, you know, just spray them down. Uh, I might take, put my birds on a leash and, and take them for a quick walk around the block. It doesn't have to be, you know, my usual rec uh, exercise routine because uh, I don't usually have an hour and a half uh, to to off my birds exercise but it's a quick way to just get them used for the day and then I do it again at night when I get home now you can provide exercise on an exercise stand or harness train your bird and take it out on walks uh, stuff like that I have a influencer uh, uh, her tech, her name on Instagram is Rocco Baby, and she's really cool. She work, she's used my harnesses and a lot of my products, and uh, she has a lot of great videos of how she enriches her parrot. Um, now, sensory enrichment is really important for our birds. Sensory enrichment is when we're getting enrichment through our senses. So birds have excellent hearing, superior vision. And um, so if we can give them enrichment through those senses while we're at work, whether it's by offering them bird TV for parrots, or if your bird's experiencing grief, you know, playing video, videos of yourself interacting with your bird, put it on a loop, put it on YouTube or whatever, and offer that up for your bird so that you can um, ensure that your bird has some sensory enrichment while you're off at work. So that's the wellness stuff. Now let's talk briefly about what's called antecedent rearrangement. So antecedent rearrangement, if you remember, is figuring out what triggers our bird in the first place. Well, we already know that our bird wants uh, us to be around them. Well, then you rearrange it. So you rearrange it with this wellness stuff that I've just talked about. Your bird has, gets triggered by the thought of being alone. That's why these birds, um, we see them plucking right before we leave for work. 
They also get triggered by being alone at night. So some of these birds will pluck at night while we're in bed. And that one always seems to be perplexing to people, but really it's a separation anxiety thing. And then they get triggered because they don't know how to entertain themselves and their brain chemistry is off, you know, in the first place. So, you know, using positive reinforcement to teach your birds new behaviors so that it doesn't just sit there and shake and be uh, paralyzed with anxiety is gonna be really important. I would really encourage you to get a book here called Clicker Training for Birds. Now this book is all about how to use positive reinforcement effectively in a fun way. And it's got some bird tricks in it, but it's also got some really super important, what we call foundational behaviors for our parents. You know, be, the manners that mom and dad would have taught them in the wild or, you know, had they lived with their mom and dad. And so, the more your bird knows how to behave and knows different things like knows how to forage, knows how to do preen properly, knows how to play, knows how to stay on its bird stand so that you feel more apt to get it out uh, during the day or during the evenings, you know, the more it has these foundational behaviors, the less nervous it's going to be. So that's how you're kind of changing up the environment so that your bird's not getting triggered. You're teaching it new behaviors, you're improving its diet, you're offering it the enrichment before you get to work, and you're using positive, fear-free methods to train it. So, you know, uh, uh, use some of these techniques and start you know, minimizing this potential separation and anxiety that your bird may be feeling. Now, a little bit more on the bird's diet that I want to talk about. You know, it's really hard to know what foods to feed your bird when uh, you're first starting out. And even, I mean, I've been doing it for a long time. But this book right here is super cool. It's called A Parrot's Fine Cuisine Cookbook. It's by Carmen Bodai. And what's so cool about this book is a couple of things. First of all, what I really love about it is that it takes a range of vegetables, nuts, fruits, sprouts, and what have you, and it tells you what vitamins and nutrients are in each different kind of uh, vegetable or fruit, whatever. And then it'll tell you, um, you know, the benefits that your bird could experience. But as you're learning, like for instance, you know, putting together, okay, Diane just said my bird needs magnesium, zinc, and calcium. You would use this guide to figure out, okay, which products actually have magnesium, zinc, and calcium that I can start feeding my bird. And you'd, you'd get a range of them, you'd figure out which ones your bird likes, and then you'd, you know, go from there. So that's how you can kind of figure out a diet for your bird. Now, um, the natural behaviors that you want to be teaching your bird. I'm going to kind of wind up here real quick, but I want to touch on the natural behaviors that you want to be reinforcing with clicker training for your bird. And that's going to be things like preening, playing, flying, bathing, socializing, perching, resting, and vocalizing. So I'm about out of battery, so I am going to wind up and I am at the end of my talk anyway. So I hope that you found these, these interventions helpful and that you can put them to use before you guys end up having to go back to school and back to work. And um, you know, stay tuned to my YouTube channel for more relevant videos to help you have a better relationship with your bird. Um, if you like this video, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. And uh, until next week, have a happy week. Thanks, bye. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, please give me a thumbs up. And if you wanna hear more useful content, I put out videos approximately every week. Uh, why don't you just plan on subscribing to my channel and you can get all kinds of useful tips to help you and your bird.